let me read to you Colossians chapter 3 and I'm going to read the first 14 verses. Colossians 3 and verse 1 begins this way. Paul says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge, in the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. That's a rich section of scripture. We won't have time to say everything there is to say about those verses this morning, of course. But there is a saying that you're familiar with, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, that may be true, but if that's our philosophy regarding our own lives and regarding our own Christian lives, then we will have very little expectation of change. We'll simply settle for the status quo and the routines that we do experience and have experienced. But what if it's true that as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. You may not be able to teach an old dog new tricks, but what if you change the dog? (laughs) Maybe a new dog when no new tricks. And the key to what I want to say to you this morning is in verse 9. You have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge and the image of its creator. When you read through the New Testament, it is full of expectancy, of change, of growth, of transformation. The goal of the Christian life, as Paul states here, is that we be renewed in the image of our Creator. This, of course, is the whole message of Colossians. We've been looking at Colossians for a number of weeks. And when Paul wrote it, of course, he was writing a continuity of thought. He was writing one truth, one message. Now, we, of course, have to break it up in order to get through it over a number of weeks. But we must... Be careful of sectioning it in such a way that we detach each section from the other. And to understand what Paul is saying here, I want to just remind you what he said in the first two chapters. Because he stated there that he is presenting the word of God in its fullness, he says. Nothing left out now. And this fullness of the word of God involves a mystery that's been hidden for ages and generations, which has not been understood. But at last he says, this mystery has been made known, and it's this. Christ in you, not in front of you, and you're following him from behind, but Christ living in you is your hope of glory, glory being the moral character of God, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now Christ in you is your hope, of being restored to the glory that you've come short of. That's the message of chapter 1. And then in chapter 2, he says, We have in him, in Christ, who now indwells us, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, all the resources we need for living. Therefore, he says, As you receive Christ, so live in him, rooted and built up in him. 
and be absolutely sure, he says, that no one, I'm quoting, no one takes you captive with deceptive philosophies that depend on human tradition and laws, human effort, human ability, which are the principles of this world rather than on Christ, since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world. So why do you live as though you still belong to it? Why do you live by such rules as do not taste, do not handle, do not touch? Why do you revert back to living under law? That's the message of the first two chapters. Because godliness, you see, is not work from the outside in. If you behave yourself and discipline yourself, somehow you'll work into your life godliness. Godliness is work from the inside out Christ now lives in you, and the Christ who lives in you is longing to express himself through you. So discipline is in order to allow your body to conform to what Jesus Christ through you is wanting to do. Now that's the message of the first two chapters. Now the thing is this, although Christ has come to live within us, a new life with new strength and new power, the old natural life that you and I have, the old life, is still within us. And if we try to live the new life by the old dog, that is by human effort, by the flesh, as is the language sometimes used, we'll never be able to change, and we never will change. But if we're now the new life within us, forgive the metaphor, the new dog, the life of Christ, who is totally different to what you and I are by nature, then his character will begin to be expressed in us and through us. Now, discipline is vital in the Christian life. But discipline is not to bring godliness into our lives. It's to let the character of Jesus Christ is within us be expressed through us. You see, if discipline works from the outside in, the idea is if you behave right, you'll become right. But actually, the Christian life works from the inside out. You become right. And therefore, you behave right as an expression of that. If you look carefully at Paul's letters, and he wrote 13 of them, most of them, if you look carefully, tend to divide into two sections. The first section of Paul's letters are what we might call Doctrine, where he teaches us truths about Christ and his work and his role. The second part of his letters are usually what we might call duty or practice that flows out of that doctrine. First part are about resources that we have in Christ. Second part is about the responsibilities that flow out of those resources. First part is about belief, the truths you need to believe. The second part is about behavior that flows out of those beliefs. That's why Paul's practical teaching always comes at the end of his epistles. If you want to know what Paul says about marriage and family, for instance, you've got to go to the end of his letters to find out that. But don't then separate that section and say, this is Paul's teaching on marriage and family. You'll just get a legal to-do list. This is the outworking of what he's already said about our union with Christ and whatever aspects of that he's been speaking about. And this is how it works out in your marriage, and this is how it works out in your family, and this is how it works out in your business, and this is how it works out in the world. That's what the practical sessions are like, and we're going to get to these in just a moment, because actually here in chapter 3, we come to the practical se section. We come to the duty that flows out of the doctrines that we've just talked about. And so he says in verse 1, Since you have been raised with Christ, that is what he's taught us in the last two chapters, since you've been united to Christ and you've been raised with Christ, there are certain things that you need to do. Set your hearts on things above. Set your minds, he says in verse 2, on things above, not on earthly things. That is... But because you've been united with Christ, you died with him, you were buried with him, you've been raised with him, then set your minds on things above, meaning that your interests are to become the interests of Jesus Christ. Your agenda is to become the agenda of Jesus Christ. What you are concerned about are to be those things what Jesus Christ is concerned about. Set your mind 
in harmony with him and with his. Not, he says, on earthly things, because there are these two competing forces in our life. We've been raised with Christ, we're indwelt by Christ, they're the things above, but competing with that are what he calls, in verse 2, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, the things that will pull you down, because you and I have two natures. We have the old natural nature, which is the earthly nature, and now by the indwelling of the Spirit of God, we have the new nature, which is the nature of Jesus Christ. And uh, this is spoken of in various ways by Paul here in Colossians. He, talk about, he talks about things above versus things on the earth. In Galatians, he talks about things of the spirit versus things of the flesh. In Corinthians, he talks about things that are spiritual in contrast with things that are natural. In Romans, he talks about the new nature in contrast with the old nature. These two are in competition, pulling in different directions and you cannot live the Christian life by the old nature you cannot evangelize the old nature don't try to sanctify the old nature we ought to crucify the old nature that's not what we'll talk about today particularly but the point is they're at enmity with each other Galatians 5 17 says the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature they are in conflict with each other so you do not do what you want to do this is the civil war that takes place within the life of every Christian it takes place in your life if you're a Christian and in my life now here's the, here's the problem if the contrast is between earthly things and heavenly things earthly things are visible Heavenly things are invisible. Earthly things are natural things. Heavenly things are supernatural, by definition. But the default position to which we revert all the time, because it's the natural default position, is the natural. It is the visible, hence the battle, because naturally you and I want to live by the flesh. We want to live by that which is natural. And that's why these first generation Christians, as the Colossians were, the church had not been there that long, had so easily slid into living by the law, by the external measurements, instead of living by the Spirit, in dependence on the indwelling life of Christ that was within them. And so Paul says to them, all right, if this mystery, hidden for ages, now revealed, is the gospel in its fullness, is Christ in you, restoring you to the glory, the character, the image of God, then this is what you need to do. You need to set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. And that traces back to what he says in chapter 2, verse 20, the earthly things, the basic principles of this world, as he calls them, do not handle, do not touch, do not taste. And we talked about that last time, the legalism that so easily we revert back to. Because the natural default position is to naturalize the spirit and to reduce the Christian life to simply something you do. You do it for Jesus rather than something which he alone can do as you live in dependence on him. This is the biggest recurring dilemma throughout the New Testament. In Galatians chapter 3, Paul says in verse 3 to the Galatian Christians, are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to live by human effort? He says, to these Galatians, why are you acting like such fools? You received the Spirit. And you know you've received the Spirit. Because in the context, he's just talked about that to them. Why in the world are you trying to live by human effort? Because you can no more live the Christian life by human effort than you can become a Christian by human effort. But so often we say, well, Lord Jesus, you saved me. Thank you so much for saving me. I now dedicate myself to live for you. I did that for years. And of course, it was a hopeless 
facade of pretending things were going on that weren't. And I so often find myself in conversation, we talk about, you know, the fact that the Christian life is a life of, that only Jesus Christ can live and he is within us and we're living it in dependence upon him and, uh, and they'll say yes, 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 and they'll say, that's all right, but, you know, we've got to do something. And they say, well, how in the world are we going to humanize this? Is basically what they often say. Now, of course, we have to do something. But sometimes we do not get our heads out of the natural and out of the visible and out of the earthly. There's a saying, it's a, it's a bit of a cheap saying, actually, that some people are so heavenly minded they're no earthly use. Well, if somebody's really heavenly minded, they'll be incredibly useful on earth. Don't worry about that. The bigger problem are there so many, many Christians who are so earthly minded, they have absolutely no heavenly use at all. Like the Galatian Christians, like the Colossian Christians, like the Corinthian Christians. All these folks were chastised in that very same area. But how is this life going to work? Because if the resources are the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ within us and in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge and such, we have everything we need by his presence within us, how does his indwelling presence work out in our behavior? This is what this passage is now about and I want to suggest to you three things here. All to do with discipline. There's to be a discipline of the mind, first of all. Then a discipline of the will. Then a discipline of the emotions. A discipline of the mind. He says in verse 1, Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And then in verse 2, Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. So he says, now then, this is first discipline. Your mind your heart, which is bigger than your, simply your mind, but of course it includes the mind, need to be set on things above. Now let's be very clear about this, that our minds are crucial in the Christian life. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now it says, this is by the transforming of your mind. Now, we're tempted, especially in our day, when everything is made easy and quick, and uh, you press a button and things happen. We want the quick fix, and the temptation today is to bypass this process of renewing the mind, and to look for quick, exotic experiences that do the whole thing in a, in a moment. And they're not there. We can only set our hearts on things above and set our minds on things above. We know what the things above are. What are the things above we have set our minds on? Well, they're those things that God has revealed to us through his word. Which is why in verse 16 of Colossians 3, a passage we'll look at more fully next week, it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. As you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Because to know the word of Christ, the word of God, is to know the mind of God. And to know the mind of God is to know the heart of God. And so he says, set your heart and set your minds, distance your mind on the things above let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That's one of the reasons we gather. That's the primary reason we gather like this. That our minds might be instructed by the word of God. Our worship flows out of our understanding. And that's why he also says that uh, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. As you teach and admonish one another, sing psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. These instruct us and teach us. That's why we sing many of these songs. They do express our worship of God, but they teach us truth about God as well. But we're not going to grow and thrive on 40 minutes of teaching a week and that's it. That's why we need to be in this book. That's why we need to spend time in the Word of God. 
and allow the Spirit of God to teach us and instruct us through his word. And so many people just rely on, well, turn up on Sunday morning, hope I can live off that. You can't live off that. If, if, if your Christian diet is listening to a sermon once a week, you'll be utterly bored with the thing on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. It won't be at the center of your life. Christ won't be the one who you're looking to to guide you and instruct you because you won't know what he's about. You won't know enough. And that's why it's so important we spend time alone in the word of God and we're part of the teaching of the word of God, whether it's in small groups, we have small groups here, not because they're just about teaching, but that's one important element that we study the word of God together and we listen to its exposition. You see, here in verse 9, chapter 3, he talks about being renewed in knowledge. Verse 10, rather, renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. We're being renewed in knowledge. You can't do that by osmosis. You can't do that by putting a New Testament under your pillow when you go to sleep at night and hope you wake up in the morning knowing something. I know people have tried to do that. It's usually superstition. We need to know what things above are. We need to know what the word of God says. Not only what it says, but why it says it. You need to understand why truth is true as opposed to what is simply what is true. Peter wrote about that in 1 Peter 3.15. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Not just the hope, what is the hope? Well, in Colossians, Christ in you is your hope of glory. That's the hope. But he says, be prepared to give a reason for the hope. Be able to understand not only what is true, but why it is true. And then it's embedded. And of course, giving other people the reason helps to embed it in their own mind. That's why talking about the things of God is so important. Talk about it. Then you'll understand it. The more you talk. And so set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated. Set your minds on things above. And spiritual experience, I'm more and more convinced, spiritual experience operates through the mind. Be very careful of those who would encourage you to bypass the mind. It's probably sinister they're trying to impose on you by saying, shut your mind off. Because as Romans 8 verse 5 says, those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. Those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. There are two Christians here, says Romans 8. Two Christians. One lives according to the flesh. One lives according to the Spirit. What's the difference? One has their mind on the things of the flesh. One has their mind on the things of the Spirit. And God has given to us minds which are the means by which he directs our will and guides us and leads us. So there's a discipline of the mind, first of all. Set your mind on things above. Secondly, there's a discipline of the will. Because in verse 5, that we read, he says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. This is something you have to do. Put to death. And he lists some things. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, down in verse 8, he gives another list. Rid yourselves of anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language, etc. Now he says, put to death these things. What does he mean by that? For some years, when I was a young Christian, I had difficulty understanding all the death and dying that seemed to be going on in the New Testament. In fact, right here in Colossians 3 is one example. In verse 3, Paul says, you for you died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. That's a past tense statement. You died, okay? That's all very well. Verse 5, put to death, therefore. Excuse me, Paul, you just said you died. Now you say put to death. How can you put to death something that's already died? Well, of course, when he speaks about you died, he's talking about our standing, our position in Christ. It's past tense. You died. When? Outside the city walls of Jerusalem, in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. As Paul said to the Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ. That is, that when Jesus Christ died, 
I died. What is your standing before God in relation to your sin? My standing is this. I died in Christ. If I owe some money, let's say in a store, and I have a debt, let's say $100, and you go to the store and you say, I understand Charles Price owes you some money. Yes, he owes us $100. Well, I got $100 here, let me pay it and clear his debt. So they say, thank you, take it. And across the record, it says, Charles Price, you know, debt $100 is paid. I go in a few days later, I say, I think I owe you some money. They say, let me check. No, you don't. But I owe you $100. No, no you've paid for it. I don't think I have. Yes, you have. Here it is. You paid. Now, I didn't pay. Personally. Somebody else paid in my place. But my legal standing, if you like, is I have paid. My standing before God is I have died with Christ. That's why Paul said in Romans 6, don't you know that all of you who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him in baptism into death. That is a fait accompli now. You have died. And all who are in Christ were crucified with him, buried with him, and raised with him. To put it simply, if it's true of Jesus, it's true of you. Because we're united now with Christ. What's true of Jesus becomes true of us. For the simple reason, there was a day when what's true of me became true of him. He was made sin, as sinful as I am. So that I might become, so that what is, what is true of me became true of him in order that what is true of him might become true of me. That sound complicated? <laughs> Sounds good, actually. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> because I'll come back to that another time. <laughs> Don't usually make notes when I'm speaking. What's true of him? What's true of me, rather, became true of him. He was made sin for us. That we might become the righteous of God. That what's true of him might become true of us. Did Jesus die? Yes. What about you? Did you die? Yes. If Jesus died, I died because I'm now united with him. Was Jesus buried? Yes. So what about you? Well, I was buried. And was Jesus raised from that? Yes, he was. So what about you? Well, I too have been raised for what? To live a new life. His history becomes my history. Now that's the past tense sense. You died. But then he says in verse 5, two verses later, put to death, therefore... Now, this is not, of course, talking about your, your standing before God. He is saying, because you have died positionally before God, although you have this new standing with God, you have this old nature in this life that fights against the spirit, which we've already referred to. And so he says, you need to put to death those things that belong to your earthly nature. He lists a few, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Now what he's saying basically there is this. These things you need to knock on the head. Put them to death, knock them on the head. Of course you're tempted in all these areas. Of course sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed. Of course these things are natural to the old nature and if the old nature can get away with these things, it will get away with these things. If no one else is noticing, you'll watch any junk you can find on the internet. Of course you will. Your old nature loves it. It loves to wallow in the muck. Of course it does. And you've got the old nature fighting against the spirit. So what do you do? You put it to death. You knock it on the head. In fact, a bit later, he says, this verse 8, he says... Um, you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language. So put them to death, knock it on the head. Then he says, rid yourself of these things. In other words, kick them out of your life. Knock them on the head and kick them out of your life. Because these are inconsistent now with the nature of Jesus Christ within you, who is seeking to express himself through you. Your will has got to be involved. You cannot live the Christian life just drifting and hoping it's all going to work out because the drift will always be away from Christ. Always be away from the center to where it's convenient and comfortable. There is that discipline of the mind, set your mind on things above, and the discipline of the will, put them to death, knock them on the head, and rid yourselves of, kick them out of your life. And then there's the discipline of the emotions. Because in verse 12, 
he says there, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love. That's a list that is very similar to the list that Paul gave of the fruit of the Spirit. You may remember love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Similar list. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, forgiveness, and love. Now, of course, love involves more than the emotion, but love is an emotion. I don't think you can detach some of these qualities from the emotional involvement, compassion. You feel compassion. Kindness, gentleness, patience, forgiveness. We have never been as widely exposed to the world as we are today. Knowledge has never been as proficient as it is today. It's everywhere. But you know, we can observe life through a glass. We watch our television news and we see the effects of a bus that's been blown up somewhere. And dozens of people killed. We look at the awful images coming from Darfur of haggard, starving people. Of course, we feel a twinge of compassion. But when the news is over, we get up and we make a cup of coffee and we do something totally different. You read how often it says of Jesus, moved with compassion. Jesus said, I always do the will of my Father. I always do those things that please the Father. But it wasn't a cold calculating what is the will of God and detach from it. I'm in a little glass bubble here, and I'll do it. No, no. His emotions were involved. We can desensitize ourselves. You know, we say familiarity breeds contempt, and so it can so easily, even with the needs of people around us. Last Monday morning in Sri Lanka, Colombo, Due to speak at nine o'clock, we had a phone call from Ravi Chandran to say that we're going to delay the meeting for a little while because of the killing of a pastor last night. And uh, we wanted to go and be with them. We didn't know any of the people before we arrived there, of course. And just to sense and empathize with the grief and the sadness. And many of those pastors in that room knew I might be next. We knew we'd be on the plane in a couple of days and out of there. And it's easy to become detached, almost like being at the zoo, looking at these people mourning and saying, is that interesting? That is not the heart of Jesus. And sometimes it's embarrassing to cry with other people around, but then just go and find a room and close the door and cry your eyes out and just feel the pain. You see, the Christian life is not a cold set of steps you take. It's a life where your mind is connected with the things of God, the things above, the things he's given to us in his word, where your will is involved in knocking on the head these things that want to surge up and rob us of our joy and rob us of our spiritual life and vitality and kick out of our lives those things which are natural to the flesh and easy to live by. 
but our hearts, our emotions need to be involved as well. And you won't really impact people's lives until you really feel for them. You can go on a mission trip and you can be, it's as though you're sitting on a bus all the time because you're looking out the windows. You're there, you're not on a bus, but you're looking at the windows and I'm looking and I'm going to be away soon. Or you can go and you can take those windows down, you can sit on the mud floor and you can put your arm around somebody and you can try to understand. We probably won't fully understand, but you try to empathize and out of that comes the compassion of the Lord Jesus. One of the most moving things to me in Colombo was when they said at the end of that service, thank you for coming. They didn't say thank you for what you said. <laughs> they said thank you for coming. Not many people come and visit us these days. It's too dangerous. Your presence means something. That's true of the folks who live across the street as well. Who are lonely. You don't have to have answers. You just have to be there sometimes. And this Christian living is not a department of our lives. Okay, Christ is in me, all right. What do I do? Okay, mind, will, emotion, okay. Let me put that in a little box, but then there's the rest of my life. This is not real till it permeates every part of our life. And out of our hearts flows the life and the love and the character of the Lord Jesus. Love is, of course, the character of God. Interesting, Paul summarizes some of those things. He says you need to put to death. And he says, which comes from greed, which is idolatry. Greed, which is self-occupied. Who's the idol? I am, of course. That's the idolatry. It's myself. Greed drains you. Greed exhausts you eventually. Love energizes you. Love feeds back into your own soul. And you have energy you didn't think you had. If in every situation you're there to give and to be a channel for the love of God, not simply there, my self-interest. Greed, which is adultery, as he says. Knock it on the head and replace it with dependence on the life of Jesus within you. You see, Jesus Christ in you wants to be one thing. He wants to be Jesus Christ. Very straightforward, isn't it? Jesus Christ simply wants to be Jesus Christ in you and through you. As we live in dependence on him. Let's pray. Let's ask God to make this real in our lives and in our experience. Father, we, we confess this morning that this wretched old life that we battle with every day it is so self-oriented, it is so greedy in that it wants only for itself. Forgive us, it's so has such foothold. It's our natural default position. We want to be liberated from that, Lord Jesus. We know we'll never be free from the temptation. That old nature will be as rotten as it's ever been. We know that. Your word tells us that it'll fight against the spirit till the day we die. But we pray, Lord Jesus, we'll be men and women who know what it means to live in the fullness of the Holy Spirit, that his attributes his love, his gentleness, his kindness, his forgiveness, 
is empathy, will flow out of our hearts. Help us, Lord, to discipline our minds, to set them on those things which are above. Our wills, that we put to death and we rid ourselves of those things which are not from you. And our emotions, help us to be willing to be vulnerable. Help us to allow ourselves to be hurt as we fully engage in the pains and hurts and distresses of other people. We pray it for your glory. We pray it because we believe this is your business. You want to be yourself in us. Make it real, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Leave me.